every now and then I feel uh, like the Lord draws me intently to to one verse in the Scripture. But and as I study, a verse just jumps out at me, and I say, "Oh wow!" But then it takes me a while to catch up with the Lord. I'll be writing a message with that one verse included in in my drafts. So I'll want to say more about it, but then. I combat myself and say, well, I have a message to write. I need to talk about the verses around it. And then finally, I feel like the Holy Spirit just says to me, no, I want you to talk about that. (laughs) And that was this week. And and many of the reasons I was resistant was perhaps because I kept telling myself, we're in a Christmas uh, series. Um, It's before Advent, I know, but the idea is called the Promise Son, and we're looking through mostly Old Testament passages i do intend to finally get to mary and jesus but we're seeing the promise of jesus played throughout uh, old testament sons as it were and we started last week at the very beginning back when the world was having just been perfect and then the fall happened and there was a promise Uh, jesus was promised with god's judgment we read in genesis 3 15 where god says to the Serpent, I will put enmity, enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. But when Eve's firstborn Cain seems to carry on the line of the serpent, and I, I suggested, and, and it has been suggested throughout history that when Eve said, I had a son with the help of the Lord, she was thinking, I had the seed that I was promised. But it might seem hopeless whenever she realized Cain is the complete opposite of what I expected with what he did. And so it might be able, we might be thinking, and Eve might have thought, God, do you really have that power? Will you really keep your word? And that hopelessness and that wonder plays into our passage today. While we examined Cain and Abel last week, we're going to Now look at some interplay between Ishmael and Isaac this week. So that's in Genesis 17. And just to have a little bit of context, we're going to stand and read Genesis 17, 16 through 19, but I do intend to hone in on verse 18. So if you're able to stand, I invite you to do so in honor of hearing the word of the Lord. Genesis 17, beginning with verse 16, reading through 19. And I will bless Sarah and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her and she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will descend from her. Abraham fell face down and then he laughed and said to himself, Can a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Can Sarah give birth at the age of ninety? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live under your blessing. But God replied, your wife, Sarah, will indeed bear you a son, and you are to name him Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. Let's pray. Father, we uh, look at this familiar story, and Father, we pray that the familiarity we have with it would not hinder the insights you give us instead we pray that we would be drawn deeper into the story that you have written in the scriptures yeah we would understand you better we would know what it meant whenever it said that you spoke to the disciples all the things concerning yourself in the law and the prophets father that we would know what you meant whenever you told the opponents you search the scriptures thinking that they have eternal life but they testify about me We want to hear about you in these scriptures. And we pray that as we come to you, that you would do the work you always do when willing hearts come to you and hear your voice. Help us to be obedient to the things you call us to do, the things you confront us with. Help us to respond accordingly. Most of all, help us to love you well and to love others well. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
I do have, I, was, I put in my notes that I have three major points, but I think you see in the outline I actually really have four major points in our message today. Uh, the first three are about, from this one verse, giving God counsel, wanting our remedies, and then God's rubber stamp. But then at the end I tie it into to Christmas and we look at Matthew 1.1. And we see the son of Abraham. So giving God counsel, wanting our remedies and God's rubber stamp. And then finally, the son of Abraham. You know, I can appreciate that this is the book of Genesis. And I I wondered, how much does Abraham know about the events of Genesis uh, 1 through 11? I mean, obviously, it came to Moses somehow. (laughs) And mostly rightly believe it's from oral tradition. But how much does does Abraham know? Does he have much history to fall back on? Maybe he maybe he would say he had some sort of understanding about a history of creation. Maybe he would say that he knew uh, the stories of Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and and their descendants. Maybe he did know about Noah and a worldwide flood. In fact, many ancient cultures have flood narratives. Maybe because a flood happened, <laughs> and maybe he knew about a failed tower and the confusion of many languages maybe abraham had a lot more than enough history for himself Uh, i just think about compared to us we know all of god's redemptive history in the bible but god perhaps unexpectedly or, or without precedence in that time probably we could say rarely for abraham's time he shows up to abraham in a in a real way we're not told how Only we're told that Abraham was told to do something drastic. He was to leave his homeland, leave his family, leave the culture that he knew, leave the city, and head out into the wilderness with nothing but a promise. I will make you into a great nation, Genesis 12, 2. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless you. Those who bless you and curse those who curse you and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham departed as the Lord directed him. And the Lord had seen him through a few things since he accepted God at his word. The Lord had spared uh, Abram and Sarai embarrassment when through their own planning they left Sarai in the harems of foreign leaders. Uh, The Lord had given Abraham a greater inheritance whenever Abraham's workers were fighting with Lot's workers and Lot took what looked most promising. But then the Lord assured Abraham that he was getting the better deal, the greater deal. God had seen Abraham through a war and Abraham was victorious. God had made his promises all the more clearer with a, a ceremony, a covenant, But even so, Genesis 16.3 tells us that upwards of 10 years had passed. 10 years of building this communication between God and He. 10 years of a, a personal faith journey. And despite the visible, tangible ways of God saving and directing Abram, Abram and Sarai seemed to have doubt. They seemed... To wonder. Abram was 70 when all this started. Uh, Sorry, I was trying to turn up my brightness. There we go. He was 70 and he was promised an offspring at age 70. Nations would come from him. He would be a blessing to the nations, to the world. But he only got older. He was already too old for children. So this promise from God was... Maybe just an ounce of a dream in his brain. Uh, We don't know how Sarah thought about it, if she ever had any sort of inkling or belief that it could ever happen. But we do know that apparently after 10 years, and maybe then some, after God had first promised Abraham this child, we read in Genesis 16, 1 and 2, Now Abram's wife Sarai had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, look now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go to my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family by her. 
And Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. First, we do know that this is a common cultural custom in ancient Near East, that if you need to extend your family and the wife you first had uh, isn't giving you any children, they might direct you to do so, what Sarai is, is telling Abram to do here. But I was thinking it's a little bit, maybe not exactly, but there's parallels, I feel like, between Eve and Sarai. Um, instead of rightfully stating God has promised children to us, she inverts it and she claims to Abram, he's kept me from bearing children. And so she forces the issue and Abram listened to the voice of Sarai. He just doesn't apparently listen to the voice of God. And in some way, maybe we've been there before. Like suffering under a barrage of, of bad advice from Job's friends. Maybe we've been there before, before finally succumbing to the world's advice, the world's worldview, the world's handle on it all. Because Abram knew what God told him, and he knew, knew what Sarai told him, which seems a little bit more sensible. I'm going to go with what Sarai says. See, maybe, maybe things aren't as God says. Maybe, maybe the wisdom of God is outdated. Maybe if, if many perceive God and, and what he says is flat out impossible or wrong, maybe I'll just finally listen to what people are telling me. I'll just give up hope and I'll give up on this promise. And in the face of God's promise again, in the echoes of God in our passage where we're at, the, the echoes of God still talking to him about a son from the womb of Sarah. We see the beginning of verse 17, chapter 17, verse 18. Abraham said to God. Abraham is giving God counsel. Do you ever give God counsel? <laughs> That's a great plan you have, God, but I have a better one, right? And our plans come from our darkened surroundings. They're molded and shaped by the fallen world, really. It has been 10 years. That's a long time. It can be. You know, I'm still wrapping my head around being pastor here for 11 years. <laughs> so I understand 10 years. But a promise of God an objective. You're going to have a child. That's a big one for old people who can't have children. You know, many depictions of Abraham lately that I've seen, whether it be on movies or TV shows, they point out what must be in some way very true. The guy had to appear crazy to those around him. Where are you going? This is where your ancestors settled. To the wilderness, to Canaan. Why for? Because a God has revealed himself to me and told me to. Where is this God? He's invisible. <laughs> Why does he want you to go? Well, he wants me to come out from the gods we've worshipped for generations and to populate this new land with many descendants. What's wrong with our gods? Why is your god better? How do you expect to make those descendants? You and Sarah are past that age. And then don't get me started on the discussions he maybe had with others when it came time for things like circumcision. Or after having Isaac, this whole take him to a hill and sacrifice him thing. <laughs> He, he, he had to have appeared maybe a little crazy. And the Bible seems to, to hone in on this relationship between God and Abraham. And others may have followed God by virtue of following Abraham, but it seems like Abraham had a more direct access to God, like Moses after him. But despite this close relationship and these ten years of history, we cannot fault Abraham for losing a little hope. For beginning to sink under the weight of what appeared to be only sensible. It's easy to lose hope. It's easy in the face of an invisible God to just kind of give in to the overwhelming ho-humness, this, this darkness. This world seems to be full of shadows and, and changes. And, you know, we think about last week if you were here. Here was a perfect world. Adam and Eve responding to the bait given to them, questioning God's goodness the world fell, and it went from curse to banishment, and then the first death that humanity would ever know was not even of natural causes, but brought on by a most ruthless sin, murder, just darkness spiraling out of control. And sometimes it feels like the world is just more weight, more problems, more sin, more grief, more despair. 
And so even though Abraham did leave his homeland for a promised one, this passage to me seems to suggest a bit of a settling, kind of a defeat. Uh, Well, this is how it really is. I've given up hope. And it's probably, as Sarah said, Ishmael is what you meant, Lord. And so his counsel to God is his own remedy. Oh, that Ishmael might live. It's a statement that has a lot of implications, a lot of presuppositions behind it. You know, Ishmael himself is really the realization of a lack of faith. It's the realization of how you and I often try to manipulate or to force God's hand as if he wasn't powerful enough. I know you're saying you're going to give me an offspring, but you know I'm too old to have kids or Sarah's too old to have kids. So just bless what we've done, Lord. Bless Ishmael. Abraham is settling. It's not how I envisioned it. It's really not how what I thought I heard when you said you're going to give me kids. I'm a little let down, but it's close enough. I'll take it. A little research into this matter yielded up three things I want to echo from my research. Three talking points, really. With Abraham wanting Ishmael, there was the battle of immediate gratification versus a long-term plan. That's the first point. So Ishmael was born. He's already there. Abraham and, and, and Hagar hatched their plan. It worked. This is how it's going to happen, God. It's been 10 years. How much longer would I have to wait if we did it your way? Ishmael's here now. Immediate gratification. You know, sometimes God wants his people to wait. And wait for a long time. Just put it in the the context of our sermon series. Who really was promised in Genesis 3.15? A seed to crush the head of the serpent. That's Jesus. He's still coming and he's still a long way off. Upwards of almost 2,000 years at this point. It would not be an immediate fix. And though Abraham was promised a child, it wouldn't be over with at night. Oh, overnight. It was upwards of 10 years at this point. But Abraham was content with the immediate plan. The immediate fix that he and Hagar hatched. There's a second point to consider. There is a comfort in familiarity. That Ishmael would live and receive the blessing. Utter understating that is this. God, I've done all the work. (laughs) You gave me the promise, but I came up with a plan. I know the plan. I wrote the plan. This plan is good. I know Ishmael. I don't know who this man you're preparing is. I don't know when to expect him. And maybe, just maybe, maybe, Abraham still wonders if he even should expect him or if he's just crazy. See, there's a comfort in familiarity. You and I know this too. It's comfortable to keep things familiar. Because lastly, connected to this, thirdly, is there is the fear of loss and change. See, that could have been what Abraham's wrestling with. It's already been quite a long time. And any person feels their mortality, probably a 80-year-old man. Um, Ishmael was finally the answer that Abraham and Sarah hatched, and to think that God would reject him and still had someone else he intended to bless and be Abraham's descendant could have played into Abraham's loss and change. See, Abraham, like us, wanted his own remedies because our remedies are often instantly gratifying and it doesn't depend on God's timetable which for many of us God's timetable is way too slow for us we want things resolved overnight Abraham like us wanted his own remedies because there's comfort and familiarity and there's fear and change or in loss we came up with Ishmael Lord was he for nothing Which leads to our third movement of this message, and that is Abraham wants God's rubber stamp. Despite it's not what God planned or intended. He says, oh, that Ishmael might live under your blessing. And in saying this, Abraham is denying what God promised. And he's asking him to bless his, Abraham's, sloppy seconds. 
his feeble attempts at doing what God had promised. I wonder if you have ever been there. You just settle. And you say, yeah, maybe this is it. Maybe this is what God meant. And you begin to believe it so much that when God does show up, and there's maybe a glimmer of something better, something God-sized, you're more willing to latch on what's before your face than what's promised because you're not sure if what's promised can actually be accomplished. Did you know that that's called doubt? When you're not sure if what's promised can be accomplished. And sometimes we slather our doubt in religious sugar. It's not that I doubt you, God, but hey, here's Ishmael. (laughs) And let's forget about Ishmael's origins, but here he is. And I just wonder, was that the God who called Abraham to begin with? Is that the same voice of authority that made a man in his 70s listen to him, leave everything he ever knew, head out to a land that's not his home with the hope of having a nation of his own? That same voice cannot bring a true son like he promised? Abraham's doubting. When you or I doubt, I believe it brings us, brings to us Actually, a loss of sight to what we're called to, to begin with. And this doubt and this loss of sight then leads to this, asking God to underperform. It's like saying, Lord, could you tie my shoes today? (laughs) When you and our eyes settle for something less, and then we try to convince ourselves, maybe even persuade ourselves that, well, God always meant this when he said that. When he said to me and Sarah, even though Hagar wasn't in the picture at the time, when he said he'd have children, he must have always meant Ishmael. Because if I dreamt that he meant what I thought he meant, my own son and Sarah's own son, and if he doesn't deliver that, well, then he's going to let me down. And God can't let me down. So I'll just dream up and do his plan and ask him to bless that. Do you hear that? It's hard to grasp. But I think it's what's there. It's really doubting. It's, to really put it in another language, it's saying, I don't think God will deliver. So instead of leaving it up in the air or leaving it into his control, I'll just deliver for him so I can maintain my faith in him. And that's really no different than a man making a statue with his own hands and then proclaiming, ta-da, a God. I mean, do you have true genuine faith in God or do you not? Do you, does he say things that he will accomplish or does he not? And when Abraham does this or if we do this, we really do ourselves a disservice. It's like we think we're going to be disillusioned someday and then just give way to extreme doubt and forfeit believing God altogether. So we've got to keep feeding the delusion. And if your faith is only that thick, then we need to get some better faith. God can deliver, and God does deliver. Abraham should not doubt what he heard. He should actually embrace it. He will have a son. He will have a nation descending from his own body. He will become a multitude. And through that son Isaac will come Jesus, the promised son. And to kind of wrap this up and turn, turn it towards Christmas, so we're looking at Jesus from a far-off lens from his ancestors. You know, whenever we think about the nativity stories, most of us, if we know our Bibles, will turn our attention to Luke 1 or Luke 2, Matthew 1 and 2, a little bit of John 1. Matthew is is writing for a Jewish audience and he wishes to show in a most Jewish way that Jesus is none other than the Messiah. He's the seed who would destroy the seed of the serpent. And so what does Matthew open up with? Of course, a genealogy, or as I like to say, a Hebrew phone book. And so genealogies, though, for ancient Jews were not for meticulous medical records, but they were more for theological purposes this meant generations might be skipped in order to make a point or to get to a point some generations might be summarized differently than we would expect so while Matthew does give a genealogy he he starts by getting his main point across from the get-go out of the gate who Jesus is he says in Matthew 1 1 
This is the record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. That's 1,000 to 900 BC. The son of Abraham. That's a 1,000 years prior still from David. Jesus is the son of Abraham. That's who we've been talking about. Jesus is the ultimate son, the promised one who would come. He is the, the fulfillment of what God was telling Abraham so many years prior when God told him to leave his homeland and bless the peoples of the earth. Isaac came, yes, but it wasn't until Isaac had Jacob and Jacob had 12 sons. Among those sons, Judah, where it eventually comes the likes of David and then ultimately Jesus. And so Jesus... Of course, already came from our time. And any who might doubt today do not doubt like Abraham did, but they doubt in one who's already been here, who's already shown he is who he says he is. But how many of us still deny what he has for us and seek out our own remedies? Even like Abraham, we might count ourselves a follower, one who has faith in him, but then we're still presenting our Ishmaels and saying, good job, God, look what you gave me. How many of us would rather rest in our pews, in our blessed assurance, tricking ourselves into thinking, well, he's not calling me to do that. He didn't promise me to do that. Could I do that? <laughs> Let us not make God in our own image. Let us actually not tame him or doubt him like Abraham did. What if there is a long-term plan that God's been working on? But what if we would rather just want our instant gratification? Just give me a dose of scripture. Give me some good worship songs and let me move on with life. <laughs> let me do this Christmas thing. Let me sing the carols and then get back to everyday living with Jesus. But I wonder if Jesus is saying, wait, 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 there's, there's actually more I can do here. And there's more I am going to do. But you and I get scared. Because there's comfort in our familiarity and there's no loss to suffer if things never change. But what if God is saying things are changing, but you don't believe me to begin with? What has God promised you that you've doubted? What, what has God asked you to do? But you know, you, it couldn't be God asking you because you're not qualified. You're too old. You don't have the skills. And you don't plan on having those skills anytime soon. And you know, time is practically running out. You know, it would be a miracle if it happened. And that's the point. He wants to do it. So it is a miracle. So, Lord, help me not to rubber stamp my Ishmael Christianity. No, help me to live into an Isaac Christianity, one where I can trust God can and will do what he says he will do. Amen? Let's pray. Father, as we looked at this son of Abraham, and Abraham wanted Ishmael, but you wanted Isaac, and then your scriptures tell us, Jesus is the son of Abraham, the son of Isaac. Father, as we look into those moments of doubt, a familiar feeling we have all had, as Abraham did. And if the Holy Spirit has been speaking to us about a promise you've given us or a charge you've given us beyond just salvation, and maybe many of us wrestle with that still, are we really saved? Does God's righteousness through Jesus really save me, or do I just need to do a little more? Help us, first of all, to rest in the righteousness you grant us through Jesus. But also help us to trust you, because I don't think you just made a bunch of us to save us and then allow us to go on our merry way until we die. But instead, you've placed us in certain settings with certain neighbors. You've given us certain relationships. And Father, you're calling us to do things that glorify your son, Jesus. And if we're unwilling to do them, would you first of all forgive us? If we have doubts, would you remove those doubts and say, yeah, you cannot accomplish that, but I can. And I want to accomplish it through you. And so I just pray that we would be willing and able to do the things you call us to do. 
especially if they seem scary, especially if all we know, like Abraham knew, he just wants me to leave and go out into this place. I don't have any other answers, but that's what I know I need to do. And if that's what you would have for us, I don't know why, but he wants me to befriend that person of all people. He wants me to call that person of all people. Whatever the case is, I pray that we would respond obediently. Even with all the questions still out there, help us to respond obediently because we trust you, because our faith is in a genuine God, not one we've made with our own hands. But we're trusting in the God who made the world from nothing and saved us from our sins through Jesus on the cross and a God who is still ruling and reigning with Jesus today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.